Hello and welcome to the WIHS Journal, Public Affairs from 104.9 FM. I'm Paul Kretschmer. Today and tomorrow, we'll be looking at the impeachment of President Donald Trump and the upcoming trial in the U.S. Senate with a longtime Washington observer, Dr. Richard Land. He'll explain his background first, and then we'll get into our conversation on the issue. Okay, well, for the last six and a half years, I have been the president of Southern Evangelical Seminary here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, We're a, 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 an interdenominational evangelical Christian seminary. Uh, before that, for 25 years, I was the head of the public policy arm of the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest um, Protestant denomination in the country, and was responsible for articulating Southern Baptist concerns and views on public policy issues, and all the way from uh, the Iraq War to abortion to um, uh, the nature of the budget and, and whether we should be deficit spending, et cetera. And uh, I am a native Texan. Um, I'm an ordained Southern Baptist minister, and I have um, um, I graduated from Princeton uh, with my bachelor's degree and from Oxford University with my Ph.D. And um, I served for 11 years from 2001 to 2012 as a commissioner on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Was it much of a jump going from your position in Washington, D.C. to becoming a president of a seminary? No, no. I'm a theologian and an ethicist by professional training. That's what my academic training is in. Mm -hmm. And before, before I went to um, work for the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, for 13 years I'd been an academic dean and a professor of theology um, and, and Christian ethics. So, uh, no, it, it, I really felt like I was going from a, from a combat command back to a training command, training the next generation. Okay. Uh, as we speak, the House of Representatives has been debating for what was supposed to be six hours, three hours for the Democrats and three hours for the Republicans on the articles of impeachment. In, in your experience, can you believe that we are once again watching um, what some people might refer to as a spectacle, uh, especially since President Bill Clinton also went through that same situation not so many years ago. Well, actually, it was, I think, 20, 21 years ago today. Yeah, that's right. And, um, and I, was, uh, I, was, I was in the chamber for one of those uh, hearings. I actually had a visitor's pass to be in the chamber for part of the, part of the hearing in the House um, uh, on Mr. Clinton. Um, no, I, I really, I, I find that, um, I find that the Trump derangement syndrome is a real a real um, uh, mental issue, and that the Democratic Party has got a um, a group case of it. I mean, I, I don't I don't think there's any reason for Mr. Trump to be impeached. Uh, I think that this that Miss, Mrs. Pelosi let the, let the cat out of the bag the other day. We said we've been trying, we've been planning this and working for this for two and a half years. Uh, what we have is a, a Washington establishment that refuses to accept a legitimate election by the American people. They have never accepted that the American people elected Donald Trump instead of Hillary Clinton as president of the United States. And they continue to reject it and continue to try to, to subvert the will of the people. I think people know, at least some people know, that, that there's the popular vote tally and then there's the electoral vote tally. And that somehow, if a person gets enough electoral votes, that somehow they should line up in such a way as the popular vote confirms one and the other confirms the, the electoral vote count. But that's not the way it turned out in the 2016 election. Mr. Trump did, in fact, come in second place as far as the popular vote's concerned, but the electoral votes are what put him over. In your opinion, do people who are watching this who may not be conversant or paid much attention to their civics lessons in the past really understand how the turnout came about in 2016 and why he, uh, Mr. Trump is therefore considered a legitimate holder of the office of president? Oh, I think, I think um, a lot of people who don't understand the Electoral College understand that he won, that he won the, the, the vote. Um, if we did not have the Electoral College, um, California and New York would elect all of our presidents because you take away, you take away Mrs. Clinton's majority in, in California and, and her majority in New York, and Mr. Trump won. He won in, he won in 48 other 
he, he got, in, in the 48 other states, he got more of the popular vote than she did. Um, and and we, I don't think the founders wanted us to have that kind of a situation. In fact, we wouldn't have had the Constitution. We wouldn't have the United States right. if it weren't for the Electoral College. Because the smaller states were not going to vote to let then Virginia and New York dominate as they would have dominated. I mean, after all, four of the first five presidents were from Virginia anyway. Right. And so, and so the Electoral College makes sure that people all over the country get to have a voice. And, you know, Mr. Trump shouldn't be penalized for running the race that needed to be run. He spent time in Michigan. He spent time in Wisconsin that Mrs. Clinton did not spend. Uh, he understood the Electoral College, and he understood how to win, and that a presidential election is a, is a, is a 50-state election. It's a different election in each state, and you have to run in each state. Mrs. Clinton ran a campaign that ignored the Electoral College, and she paid the price. As far as the, the articles that, that the House has been debating, is in your opinion, is there any real solid, I guess the, the law enforcement people would say, forensics that actually justify what the Democratic majority is doing? Because from the outside, at least, it looks like just a plain old, we have the votes to pass this through, and we don't care what you think, because this is what we want, and we're going to do it and, it, and and you can just stew about it. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, when, when Mr. Clinton was impeached, um, Mr. Starr, the independent counsel, presented to the House um, compelling evidence that the president had broken several laws. And in fact, he was subsequently, um, he subsequently had to surrender his law, his license to practice law. Uh, a federal judge that he had appointed uh, required him to forfeit his practice, his license to practice law because he had committed perjury. He lied under oath. Um, there's no such evidence that President Trump has done anything of that ilk. And as Jonathan Turley, the constitutional lawyer from George Washington University, pointed out, for them to charge him with obstruction of justice uh, while they did not go to court to enforce the subpoenas that they had issued uh, was an abuse of power by the Congress. We have three branches of government, and the presidential branch is not, is not subservient to the legislative branch or vice versa. We have a third branch, the uh, judicial branch, that is to decide disputes. Mr. Nixon turned over the Watergate tapes not because Congress subpoenaed them, but because federal judge Sirica required him to do so. The Congress, the House, just ignored the Supreme Court and ignored the courts in general and just decided, well, he won't give them to us, so we're going to charge him with obstruction of justice. If they were to be successful, and they're not, of course, but if they were to be successful in convicting this president and removing him from office, they would have altered our form of government. Through this use of impeachment, they would have made the president a, a glorified prime minister that could be removed by a, la by a lack of confidence vote. That sounds very parliamentary as opposed to the way our U.S. Congress works. That's, that's exactly right. They would have switched our government to a parliamentary type of government, which I don't think would serve us well, and it certainly subverts the Constitution. In your opinion, did the framers of the Constitution leave a lot of wiggle room for people who want to do something that isn't necessarily prescribed in the Constitution as written, but which perhaps should have been precluded by additional language, or would that be overreaching? Well, no, I think they tried to anticipate. Um, you know, I had to, when I was at Princeton, I had to read the Federalist Papers. Um, I did, too. <laughs> had, a, had a course in constitutional law, and... You know, one of the great fears that the Founding Fathers had was that impeachment would be used for purely partisan political purposes. They were terrified of a purely partisan impeachment. And this is the first one in our history. This is the first time that you have an impeachment that is totally partisan. Dr. Richard Land is my guest today and tomorrow on the WIHS Journal talking about the impeachment trial in the Senate of President Donald Trump. For further information, call us at 860-346-1049. The opinions expressed are those of the participants, not necessarily those of the staff or management of the station. I'm Paul Kretschmer on the WIHS Journal, public affairs from WIHS Middletown.